Welcome to Japan Experts. I am Miyuki Seguchi. In this podcast, we will explore the cultural wonders of Japan together with Japan experts who have in depth knowledge about authentic Japan. For each episode, we will investigate the mystery of Japan's cultural treasures, such as artistic activities, historic sites, and local customs. If you'd like to support this podcast, please share Japan Experts with the people you know and write a good review on Apple Podcast or our YouTube account. We also have an account on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so please do follow us to get the latest updates. Today, we will explore the wonders of Japanese flower arrangement, Ikebane. The history of Ikebane dates back to 600 years ago. Nowadays, Ikebane is enjoyed by people not only in Japan, but also in the rest of the world. To discuss more about Ikebane, I'd like to invite Stephen Kodu, First degree master of the Ohara School of Ikebane, which is the highest title that Ohara School Ikebana practitioners could receive. Stephen has practiced Ikebane for more than 20 years in Japan. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to do this. First of all, could you explain Ikebana (laughs) in one sentence? Oh, a difficult question. Um, Ikebana is the ancient Japanese art of flower arranging and uses flowers, branches, and leaves um, to create unique living pieces of art that show the unique beauty and character of the materials. Interesting. So Ikebana is art using flowers and other materials. Yes. So how is it different um, from flower arrangement in Western countries, for example? Oh, um, usually Western floral arrangements are very large. They use a lot of flowers. Um, Many flowers are in full bloom. But for Ikebana, um, usually less is more. Simple is best. Um, Space is important. Asymmetry is important. Um, So using fewer materials to show off the individual characteristics of the materials is very, very important in Ikebana. Also trying to show the beauty of the seasons is also um, important for Ikebana. Interesting. There are many differences um, between Japanese flower arrangement and the Western flower arrangement. So you mentioned the less is more culture. Um, so I I say this is really uh, related to the mindset of Japanese people. Um, why do you think um, the Japanese people appreciate uh, less is more culture? <laughs> Another difficult question. Um, I think there are a couple of um, reasons. One of them is um, perhaps the Zen culture. Um, Zen has been, Buddhist Zen has been in Japan for a very, very long time. And with Zen, um, you try to quiet your mind, calm your mind and spirit um, to enjoy each moment by moment. So you're always trying to clear your mind and just enjoy what's around you. So having something very simple makes that easy for you to clear your mind and meditate. Um, So I think that kind of carries over from Zen Buddhism into Japanese culture. And another reason I also think is that Japan is a very small country. Um, It's only about the size of California when you put it all together, all the islands of Japan. So houses are also very small. So in a typical Japanese house, there are not a lot of um, places or spaces where you can decorate. So Ikebana is very small, compact, and very simple. So it looks beautiful in that small, compact space. So the Japanese word Ikebana literally means keeping flowers alive or 
bringing a life to flowers. But actually, flowers are not the only materials that are used in Ikebane. Um, you mentioned um, that you also use branches and leaves. Um, so do you think um, this would be another difference um, from Western flower arrangement? Oh, yes, I think so. Um, using anything that you can find in nature, um, branches, stem, leaves is okay for Ikebana. And actually, when you get to higher levels, um, there's also something called Zoke Ikebana. And that's more of like a sculptural work or a sculptural arrangement. And I have done some of those in the past where I've used coffee filters. Um, I've used um, styrofoam cups. And um, another thing I used was dirt mixed with glue. And I made like a paste out of that. And I had a beautiful shape that I had carved. And I put the dirt paste all over the shape. And um, I use that also. So anything can be used in Ikebana. So it makes it very, um, very easy, I guess you could say. No matter where you are in the world, you can make an Ikebana arrangement. Interesting. So in that sense, the Ikebana is art. Yes, I think so. I always call Ikebana a living art. So how would you choose uh, materials usually? So, so you need to have this artistic um, <laughs> mindset to um, do the Ikebana? Yeah, mm, I think yes and no. Um, in the beginning, um, my teacher always chose materials for me. And now I choose my own materials. Um, so like for beginners, um, using something very simple. In the beginning, um, you're learning the basics. So things that grow up um, vertically or things that grow out to the side horizontally, thinking about that. Um, so maybe like for beginners, you would use um, uh, liatris, which grows straight up towards the sun or um, gladiolus, which also grows straight up towards the sun. And then you can either combine using flowers, um, using the color of the materials, or you can also combine using different textures. And um, then of course, when you get up into the higher levels, um, there are different forms, different styles. And so if you are doing like a landscape arrangement, you would use things that you find in the forest or use things that you find near the shoreline, something like that. Um, so it's um, just kind of like personal preference of what you choose. And then if you're trying to make something specific, looking around you to try to imitate that, what you find in nature in a container. Interesting. So I actually have tried a few Ikebana lessons oh. and the materials were provided um, yes. for my lessons. And these materials shows the season to just give a little bit of idea to our listeners. Um, could you share some of the um, materials for each season? Oh, okay. Um, in spring, one of the most popular things to use is sakura or cherry blossoms. And um, those are found all throughout Japan. And usually they start showing up in the flower shops in maybe February or March. So it comes very early. So using cherry blossoms with mustard flowers, a um, pink and yellow combination is very popular in the spring. You could also use um, sweet peas, um, fern shoots, different things like that. Um, in the summer, um, in the Ohara Ryu, the school I belong to, we use mizumono. And mizumono are materials that you find in the water. So using iris flowers or water lily, um, lotus. Um, all of those are very beautiful, very difficult to do, but very beautiful. And then, of course, um, using lilies or hydrangeas, um, beautiful green maple leaves are also very good summer materials. Um, and then in the fall, which is my favorite season, um, using chrysanthemums, which are very, very plentiful in Japan, beautiful different varieties can be found. Um, uh, you can use beautiful maple leaves that have turned red. Um, you could use some coxcomb, um, burnet, um, many different things. And then in the winter, there aren't a lot of materials that are specifically winter because there's snow on the ground in many parts of Japan, but using pine. 
pine is grow um, is green throughout the seasons. Um, so we use lots of pine and also narcissus, which are the Japanese um, daffodils, and they smell very beautiful too. Um, so there are many things you can use throughout the year. Interesting. I am very amazed how many materials that are used in Ikebane. <laughs> Anything can be used. <laughs> so to um, feel the seasonality, uh, what else do you keep in mind uh, when you create Ikebana artworks? Um, there are maybe three other things that are also important when you're trying to um, make an arrangement. And one of those are containers, the type of container that you want to use. Um, do you want to make an arrangement in a vase? Do you want to make an arrangement in a suiban, which is a large, flat, the, um, the bottom of the vessel is flat with a little wall around it. Um, so containers are very important. Also, the color of the container. In the summer, when we're doing the mizumono arrangements, usually the container is a light blue or a blue color. So when you pour the water into the container, you see that beautiful blue color and it makes it feel very um, cool and refreshing. And then maybe another important thing is the color itself of the different materials. So in the summer, using bright colors helps you to feel that heat of summer. And in the spring, maybe using pink and yellow or um, pastel colors, it really helps to enhance the spring feeling. And then I think maybe the last thing that you need to think about is the place where the arrangement is going to be displayed. Um, is it going to be placed against the wall? Is it going to be placed on the middle of a table to be seen from all around? Um, when you think about that, um, that also influences you on the materials that you will use. So like you said, Ikebana put such a strong focus on seasonality. This is also seen in the history of Ikebana. So what was its origin and how was it evolved into the current form of the art? Oh, another difficult question. <laughs> in the very beginning, um, Japanese religion is based on Shintoism. And Shintoism is the belief that everything has like a deity, a living spirit or God in it. So um, the flowers, the trees, the stones, the rivers, um, even the rain and wind had spirits in them. So um, people would um, take these flowers and bring them inside and they're bringing that deity inside their home to help bless the home. So in the very beginning, we had that um, spiritual belief in Ikebana. And then um, Buddhism came into Japan from China um, a long, long time ago, <laughs> many, many years ago. And with that also, um, there were flower offerings that the Buddhist monks would put on the altars in the temples and they are called kuge. Um, and from there, we have different um, styles that came from that kuge called tatehana and dika. Tatehane, um, in Japanese, it can be translated as standing flower? Yes, um, that's right. So what kind of style is that? Um, during this time, the flowers were arranged in vases. And like you said, they were standing flowers. And this is where um, the very first school, Ikenobo, um, started. Ikenobo Senke, he was the first headmaster. Um, and he used flowers and they were put into the alcoves called tokonoma in Japanese homes. Um, and this was a very new part of Japanese homes during this time. Um, there were rooms with tatami mats. And um, so you put something in the tokonoma to add a little touch of beauty, a little bit of the outdoors inside. So the next you said rika. So rika. how is it different from tatehana? Rika is much more involved. There are a lot more branches put into the arrangement. Tatehana is very simple. Um, when you get into Dika, um, each stem had a symbolic meaning, which was drawn from religion or the landscape art around you. Um, and so you had like an earth symbol, a heaven symbol, a man symbol, 
and combining those in one arrangement. But they were very, very technical and very elaborate. So not a lot of people did these type of arrangements. These were done by the noble class in Japan. So like samurai would also do ikebana to help calm their hearts. Um, and then from there, we get into nageide, where you, it's a little bit more free-forming where you do arrangements in vases. Um, and then also another influence is chabana, which are um, flowers that you use during the tea ceremony, which is also a very sophisticated art form here in Japan. And then we get into shoka, where it starts to spread a little bit more into the everyday class of society. Um, and then we get into bunjin. And then from there, we really start to open up and get spread into the different schools throughout Japan. Interesting. And of course, we have Moribanu. And the, your school, Ohara School, is famous for Moribanu. Yes. So could you explain how it was um, born and how it was developed? Sure. Um, before um, Ohara Ryu, there was um, or Ikenobo, which is the origin of Ikebana. And the first headmaster of the Ohara school, um, when he was practicing this, um, that Ikenobo style, um, during that time also, um, the doors to Japan had opened back up. For a long time, Japan has shut itself off from the outside world. And during that time, that's when Ikebana became very stylized. But when the doors opened back up, um, Western ideas, Western culture, Western flowers, materials flooded into Japan. And in Ikenobo, they used Japanese materials. So it was very difficult to try to use those new materials in an Ikenobo arrangement. So the first headmaster, he branched off from that. And instead of doing arrangements with a very tight base, he started doing arrangements in a large suiban. And the suiban is just a large um, container, a flat container with a wall around it. And instead of combining everything together in the center, we have that triangle shape. And he chose three points to make a plane across the container. And instead of having everything go up from one point, he had everything kind of branch out from a plane. And um, it shocked a lot of the Ikebana community because they had never seen anything like that before. Um, very new. And for a long time, people didn't like it. But now every other school within Japan also has some type of Moribana um, form within their school curriculum. Interesting. So you mentioned Ikenobo and Ohara School. Of course, and then um, actually there are three biggest um, Ikebana schools in Japan, right? Um, yes. Within Japan, there are three main schools. We have Ikenobo, Oharadyu, and Sogetsu. Um, and they are all Ikebana, schools of Ikebana, but they're all slightly different. And actually, when you look at all the different schools within Japan, there are over 3,000 different schools. So there are many different um schools that have branched off from the main schools. So you have practiced Ikebana for more than two decades. Um, yes. Could you talk about uh, your journey to where you are now, which is highest level for your school, right? Yes, yes. Um, when I first came to Japan 22 years ago, um, I didn't think I would be here a long time. So I wanted to try some type of Japanese culture. And I didn't know, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, but I had a mutual friend who had done karate. So I started to take karate lessons. I liked it, but I'm not a fighter. I don't like confrontation. <laughs> so karate really didn't um, go for me. It didn't really match my soul. And I was at an English speaking event and um, we were doing self introductions. And one of the people in my group was an Ikebana teacher. And I thought, oh, well, I like flowers. I like nature. So maybe I can try Ikebana. And I started taking Ikebana lessons from her. Um, I'd always had 
an interest in flowers. Um, in high school, actually, I was a um, flower delivery person for a local flower shop, which was very fun. And so I started taking Ikebana lessons from her. Um, and in the very beginning, I took, because I really liked it and I wanted to learn a lot, I took lessons twice a week for about a year. Um, and I learned a lot within that year, but it was also difficult for my teacher um, because she had to try to think of different material combinations um, every week. Um, and then also, um, being an American, I always ask the why question. Why do we do this? Why do I cut this? Why, why do I angle it down 40 degrees? Um, and in Japan, um, maybe you also know, that's not really something that typical Japanese people do. Typical Japanese people maybe just listen to their teacher say, okay, but they really don't understand why. So me asking my teacher why all the time um, caused her to change her teaching style. Um, and so in the beginning also, I took many tests. I have a monthly test. Even now I go to the monthly tests. And um, in the beginning, there were, I think, five students and we were all the same level and we would each month go to the test. And um, before we go to the test, we know what materials we are going to use, the container we're going to use, and the form that we're going to do. And usually um, all five of us would do something slightly different or completely different. And other teachers would always ask my teacher, how did they do that? How did they know how to do that? And I think it's because she told us the why. So instead of just doing what our teacher said, we thought about it, we looked at the materials carefully and really tried to bring out that natural beauty in each stem. Um, and like I said before, even now, I also take um, the monthly tests. And I also like to take part in spring and autumn exhibits. And to me, that's just a fun challenge. Interesting. So it's great that you met a great teacher uh, who put a great influence on, on your style. Um, yes. But 22 years is a very long time. Uh, have <laughs> you ever thought about giving it up? No, actually. <laughs> um, I really like Ikebana. Um, I, I usually say it's my Ikebana journey. And that can also be translated into kado, or the way of the flowers, the, the road to flowers. Um, so to me, um, even though I have been doing it for 22 years, there are still many things that I have not got to do because the materials are very expensive or it's a very large arrangement that you don't do in your own home. So even though I've been doing it for 22 years, there are still many challenges um, that I have left to do. Um, and some, there are some days when I don't want to go to lessons because I've had a bad day. Um, I'm stressed out. I'm tired. I just want to go home. But when I go to my lessons, sit down and look at my flowers, a calm comes over me and I relax. And so to me, doing Ikebana also is a very relaxing time, a stress reliever for me during the week. So I don't want to give that up either. What else have you learned through Ikebana? Um, I think um, being an American person, <laughs> um, many times you want things now. You want it the best. Um, flowers, you want them in full bloom. Um, you want to be instantly satisfied, I think, a lot of Americans. Um, and through Ikebana, I've learned to relax more. Um, I've learned to um, de-stress, but also I've learned that not only flowers in full bloom are beautiful, but buds, the flowers that are still budding are also very beautiful. And when you use a bud in your arrangement, you also get to enjoy watching it open up and you actually get to see that the flower is living, which is part of Ikebana, living flowers, living art. Um, so I like that. And I also think it's kind of helped in my own um, creativity before I liked things to be very symmetrical. And now I don't like things to be symmetrical. I like things to be unbalanced or asymmetrical. Um, and so if I'm decorating something in my apartment, I always try to make things look unbalanced. 
to me, if something is balanced, it feels very rigid and it doesn't feel relaxed. So I think that's also influenced me in that way. Interesting.、Um, <clears throat> so you're also teaching Kebana to students from home and abroad, right? Yes. So, so what kind of changes have you noticed through their learning process? Um, I think, like me, many students have learned to be focused and they stay focused.、Um, and several students have said to me, it's also their time to relax. They like to come and unwind during that time. When you do Ikebana, you kind of enter a zone where you're only thinking about the flowers.、Um, and so you do kind of forget everything around you, like the Zen meditation. Um, so that's kind of helped with some people.、Um, I do have one student、um, who used to rush through everything and she would take the materials, cut them, put them in the kins on. Oh, I'm finished. And oh, wait, wait, wait.、Um, but now she、um, has learned to slow down. She's learned to look at the materials very carefully and not just cut and place them、um, in the arrangement. So I think it's helped her to slow down also. Fantastic. So I'm sure our listeners have a strong interest in Ikebana now. So, what do you think would be a good first step to take if they would like to try Ikebana?、Uh, I think one of the easiest things to do is to, of course, jump on the internet and、um, see if there are any classes offered around you.、Um, I know that the Ohara Ryu, I live in Japan, we have many chapters throughout Japan. But there are also chapters throughout the world. There are chapters throughout Europe,、um, America, South America, Australia, all over the place.、Um, so, first, I would see if there are any classes around you. Books are also a great resource, but they're flat. So, you can't really, I mean, looking at the picture, yes, you can look at beautiful arrangements. But you can't really see the arrangement. So it makes it hard to understand、um, depth in an arrangement. And then, of course, maybe you can also look for some online resources if you can't find classes around you, which I know can be difficult for some people if they don't live near a big city. So you also provide online、um, Ikebana lessons through your website, right? So what kind、yes. of options do you offer?、Um, There are several different options. I want anybody anywhere to be able to enjoy Ikebana the way I enjoy it. And like I said before, I know some people who don't live near a big city、um, don't have that opportunity. And I think that's very sad just because you don't live in a big city. So、um, I started、um, a website where I teach Ikebana lessons.、Um, there is a monthly subscription where you pay a monthly fee and you receive a video a month. Um, which goes into great detail explaining the why,、um, things like that. Or you can also buy the、um, lessons as a course. So, like the beginner's course, the intermediate course, and you get access to all of the lessons at once and you can work at your own pace.、Um, and you can actually, on my site, which is the only site that Ohara Ryu allows this to do, you can get the first four certificates.、Um, For the Ohara Ryu School of Ikebana. Great, I might try that for myself. Please do, please do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, if the people actually like to appreciate the world of Ikebana,、uh, are there many places to visit、um, in Japan or maybe outside Japan?、Um, I think if you're in Japan, it's very easy. Um, of course, Japan, Ikebana, <laughs> it's part of the culture. So, if you are coming to Japan, just going to a temple,、um, most temples will have a flower offering on the altar, that old style, and you can see that at the temple. Or many department stores have large、um, Ikebana exhibitions. And one of the、um, big department stores, Takashimaya in Tokyo,、um, they will have exhibitions for the different schools. And then in the fall, they also combine、um, all of the schools, the Japan Ikebana Art Association.、Um, they combine all the schools and have a very, very large Ikebana exhibition. So you can see many different schools and many different styles.
Um, if you are not in Japan, I think it would be a little bit more difficult to enjoy Ikebana. But one of the things you can do is check with your local Japanese embassy. And lot, many times they will have、um, small exhibitions and they also might actually offer classes. And of course, there's always the internet. There are many Ikebana groups on Facebook. And、um, if you go onto Instagram and insert the hashtag Ikebana or hashtag Ohara Ryu, you can see many, many beautiful pictures of Ikebana arrangements. Interesting. It's good to connect with、um, people practicing Ikebana, right? Yes. I have friends from all over the world now、um, who do Ikebana. So it's, it's fun. Great. So, Stephen, thank you.、Um, any last message to our listeners?、Um, I guess what I would like to say is that、um, Ikebana isn't just a Japanese thing.、Um, anybody anywhere can do Ikebana using the principles that you learn.、Um, if you like nature, if you like art, if you like the outdoors, I think Ikebana would be something that most people would enjoy、um, and to maybe learn more about it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your great insights. I am sure that our listeners are very much inspired as I am now. Thank you well, so much, Steven. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Today's Japan expert was Steven Koru, first degree master of the Hara School of Ikebanu. Steven creates beautiful Ikebana artworks, so I'd highly recommend that you check them out on his website as well as on his social media accounts. You can find the links in the description section of this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Japan Experts. If you like today's episode, please share your comment or send a message using one of our social media accounts. We would love to hear from you so that we can create better content for you. Thanks again, and please join me in two weeks to explore many other wonders of Japan. <music>